the hill of Yahweh and stand in his place? Those with clean hands and pure hearts who practice honesty. We saw his glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but the Son has made him known. The heavens herald God's glory and declare his handiwork. God never left the peoples without witness to his goodness. God sends rain, <coughs> and and fruitful seasons. Blessed be the name of God.
Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before whom is it a, a devouring fire, round about whom is a mighty storm? God calls to the heavens above and to the earth that the people may be judged. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare God's righteousness, for God alone is judged. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. But I will not accept a bull from your house, nor a he goat from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes, or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see thieves, you are their friends, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then, who forget God, lest I rend, and there be none to deliver. Those who bring thanksgiving as a sacrifice to honor me, to those who ordered their way aright, I will show the salvation.
Good morning. Good to see you all. I understand there's a game going on this afternoon, and from what I hear, Taylor Swift may be winning. <laughs> what um, joys or concerns do you have to share at this time? Yes? Continue praying for Urban, Hamilton, Gina. Um, so glad, of course, to see Diana and the gals behind me. That just makes my day. And mm -hmm. also, um, thanks everyone for any prayers you have lifted up for my cousin Lori. Um, she went before the board this past week, and they have approved her to go on the list for a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. um, of course. There's still waiting to be done and all that, but she has been approved, so that is a definitely a blessing. Okay. We have thanks for having Diana back with us and the group home as well. And uh, praise for Lori being, um, being approved for heart transplant. Mm -hmm. okay. Others? Yes. Would you share a name? Her name is Levon. Levon. Pray for Levon, who is going through breast cancer. Okay. And? Dixie is getting worse. We pray for her. Okay. Others? Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you that no matter what we do, where we go, or what we say, you are present with us. Guide our hands, guide our feet, guide our words and our actions, that we might always be a visible memory of your presence, a reminder that you are here in this world. We lift before you these that we have mentioned, Irvin, Diana, the group home, Laurie, Levon, Dixie. And there are others that we have not mentioned by name, but for whom we are also concerned. We celebrate with you the gift of life that you have given to these, to us, to others. Remind us of your care and grant that we might be extensions of your care and support for these and all we encounter. We recall those words by which Jesus taught us to seek your face, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
needs to see you, that desperately needs your touch upon their lives, that desperately needs your character to be revealed, calling us out of violence and anger and hate and into love, joy, peace. Grant that as we bring these gifts to you, we also bring our lives into your service. To be your hands and feet, that the world might indeed see you as you are. For it is in Christ's name we pray. I invite you to turn your attention with me to the reading of 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when Yahweh takes Elijah to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha are on their way from Gilgal. Elijah says to Elisha, stay here, for Yahweh sends me as far as Bethel. But Elisha says, as Yahweh lives and as you yourself live, I do not leave you. So they go down to Bethel. The company of prophets who are in Bethel come out to Elisha and they say to him, do you know that today Yahweh takes your master away from you? And he says, yes, I know, keep silent. Elijah says to him, Elisha, stay here for Yahweh sends me to Jericho. But he says, as the Yahweh lives and as you yourself live, I do not leave you. So they come to Jericho. The company of prophets who are at Jericho draw near to Elisha. And say to him, do you know that today Yahweh takes your master away from you? And he answers, yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah says to him, stay here for Yahweh sends me to the Jordan. But he says, as Yahweh lives and as you yourself live, I do not leave you. So the two of them go on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also go and they stand at some distance from them as they both are standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah takes his mantle and rolls it up and strikes the water. The water is parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them cross on dry ground. When they cross, Elijah says to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, 
Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responds, you ask a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am taken from you, it is granted you. If not, it is not. As they continue walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separate the two of them, and Elijah ascends in a whirlwind into the heavens. Elisha continues watching and cries out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he can no longer see him, he grasps his own clothes and tears them into two pieces. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Is seeing God enough? Is seeing God too much? What do we even mean by seeing God? Over the years, I've been taught songs that refer to seeing God in some wistful, ecstatic, or trance-like manner. I never really imagined that those singing such songs actually meant a whole lot by them. Rather than focusing attention on God, they were actually focusing attention on self. Upon the singer's experience or the author's personal experience. They were focused on some mystical, internal, emotive experience completely foreign to events of God's appearing as we find them described in the Bible. When we find biblical characters who come into contact with God, their lives are changed. They are transformed. Their responsibilities increase. They're called out of their comfort zone. Is that what we are after in our hope for seeing God? It was no secret that Elijah's time as prophet of Yahweh was coming to an end. He wasn't on his deathbed. No one had called in hospice. He wasn't injured. His health was not failing. He was not surrounded by enemies who were seeking to kill him. No king or queen of Israel was currently seeking his death. In fact, he had been threatened by a king. He had survived a famine, had been fed by ravens during that famine at a brook until it dried up. Then he had left the country and gone to a neighboring country where he was cared for by a widow with no resources to care for his needs. He'd fled again after death threats from Jezebel, queen of Israel thinking he might just lie down in the wilderness somewhere and die rather than allow her to send her goons after him. He had been fed, restored, sent on his way to meet Yahweh and then continue with his ministry. This was nothing like any of that. He had survived many trials, but now he found himself ready for Yahweh to carry him away. And both he and the majority of the prophets in Israel understood this. They were fully aware that this was the day. Elijah's time was up. So Yahweh turned him toward the wilds on the eastern side of the Jordan. He journeyed from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and then to the banks of the Jordan River where the Israelites had reportedly crossed over into the land of promise. They enter this land where Yahweh had dealt somehow differently, more directly with the people throughout their wilderness wandering. Elijah had not encouraged 
Elisha to tag along. He told him repeatedly to stay behind. This journey was not about him. This journey was not about ministry. This was Yahweh taking him away. Elisha was having none of that. We don't know how long he had been Elijah's servant. Today's text is the first that we ever hear about him. But these bands of prophets who they encounter along the way seem to know him by name, identify him by his role as servant to Elijah. We may have no record of Elisha in the Hebrew scriptures before this particular scene, but his contemporaries knew him. He apparently had some history with Elijah. We just aren't privy to it. On the basis of this history, Elisha was already by Elijah's side. As Elijah turned toward Bethel, the house of God, he told Elijah to depart, Elisha to depart from him. Elijah was determined to go on. If this was to be his last experience with Elijah, he was not going to cut it short in any way. Elijah had been, after all, the greatest prophet of Israel since the time of Moses. And will be looked upon the same way even in the time of Jesus and beyond. There was something special in and about Elijah that Elisha wanted to cling to. He wanted to belong to this something special. There was, this was where he was seeing Yahweh's presence. And this was where he wanted to remain, to belong. To live. They left Gilgal. They walked to Bethel. They continued on toward Jericho. They walked from there down to the Jordan. On leaving Jericho, a band of some 50 prophets left the town with them and followed them at some distance away. As these two continued down to the banks of the river, no one really knew what was coming. All they knew for sure was that Elijah was not coming back. Arriving at the water's edge, Elijah rolled up his mantle, a symbol of his prophetic office. And he used it to strike the water akin to Moses wielding the rod or staff in his hand. The waters of the Jordan receded, and the two were able to proceed across to the other side. On the far bank, we become privy to some of their conversation. Elijah finally asks Elisha directly, what do you want from me? What are you after? What blessing are you seeking? What should I do for you before Yahweh finally takes me away from you. Elisha asks him for a double portion of the breath or spirit which is upon him. This doesn't mean twice as much of God than is on Elijah. This is more akin to inheritance laws where the eldest son would receive a double share of the inheritance because he also received a double share of responsibility caring for the deceased widow any unmarried daughters running the household and so to help him carry the burden of the responsibility that he accepted he was granted a double share of the inheritance. This is what Elisha is seeking. He wants to be the heir to Elijah. 
as the prophet of Yahweh to whom everyone will point and go to and seek out Yahweh's direction. He wants to be used of Yahweh in very special ways. He was asking to become Elijah's replacement among all these other prophets already mentioned in this passage. He wanted to become the next preeminent one among the prophets. This is the first time we really see Elijah halt, caught unguarded, balking along the course of his ministry. When Elisha makes this request, Elijah is caught up short. He's unable to answer him directly. He says whether or not Elijah Elisha would be accepted by Yahweh was above his pay grade. It wasn't something that he could convey. He says that on the other hand, if Elisha is able to see Elijah as Yahweh takes him from the earth, then he will know that his request has been granted, not by Elijah, but by Yahweh. They continue walking and talking into the wilds. Suddenly a chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire separate the two, and Elijah is caught up in a whirlwind which takes him into heaven. Elisha is beside himself exclaiming over and over, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. When Elijah and the flaming chariot are removed from his sight, Elisha tears his clothing in two pieces, a sign of grief and humility in light of his unworthiness to have been granted such a sight and a boon. Suddenly, Elisha seems to feel unworthy unworthy of the boon that he had himself requested. At the same time, he is overjoyed at the blessing. He's somewhat uncertain as to how to proceed appropriately under the mantle left to him in the wake of Elijah's removal in the whirlwind. In this mix of emotions and reactions, he turns back from what he had just witnesses, witnessed. Elisha turns to the Jordan, and there he takes the mantle that had fallen from Elijah's shoulders and strikes the water with it, saying, Where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? Is it really true? Has God truly blessed me with becoming Elijah's successor? Elijah had considered this a big request. Elijah had considered this beyond his pay grade, something that he had no authority to concede. Yahweh doesn't seem to have considered it. So big a deal. Yahweh is willing to grant that Elisha might see these chariots of fire and these horses of fire and watch as Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind into heaven. A few chapters later, we'll read of Elisha again seeing the chariots and horses of fire as they surround the enemies of God's people. Elisha was not seeking blessing for fame, for comfort, for power. He was assuming responsibility 
responsibility to represent Yahweh before the nation and its political leadership along the lines of how Elijah had done so under death threats, under exile, running for his life, having to be fed by ravens because he couldn't walk into towns and be seen. Interestingly, Elisha never asked to actually see Yahweh. He did not ask for the ability to see God's fiery chariots and horses that he will later see again. Instead of seeing some ecstatic, emotional, or mystical experience, he had requested that God wield him as God had been wielding Elijah. His request placed him in a position of service. Not only to Elijah, but now directly to Yahweh. Seeing God in the world of God's breath, God's fiery chariots and horses, was almost incidental. It resulted from first placing his life entirely at God's disposal. Is that not where we begin truly seeing God? When we open ourselves to the reality of who God is, what God wants of us, and we place ourselves into God's service, that is when we begin to see God isn't it? If you would turn with me in your blue hymnals to hymn 398, Jesus calls us. Blue hymnals, number 398. Recognizing your presence in our midst. As chariots and horses of fire that we cannot see. And yet with the eyes of faith we understand that you are indeed with us. We see you in the lives of others who have modeled the way of Jesus who have come before us, who have called us onward to join our lives, our ministries, our service to that of others who have tread this path before us. <clears throat> Grant us the courage, we pray, that we might be willing to see you and allow you to be seen through our lives as we represent you in this world faithfully. For it's in Christ's name we pray, 
Amen. Amen.